go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast from the shores of Lake Tahoe. I am Ryan Nauman, the market strategist here at Zephyr. Now, until recently, U.S. equities have had a really solid 2024 while volatility remained mild. Well, that all changed as volatility has spiked recently and equities have tumbled. Uh, in fact, the NASDAQ has fallen into correction territory since its recent high in July, which might be a surprise to some since the NASDAQ was carrying a market performance. While the S&P 500 is off nearly 6.5% since mid-July. Well, I have on the perfect guest to talk about the recent shift in market sentiment. But first, today's episode is sponsored by the award-winning Zephyr, which helps investment professionals make more informed investment decisions. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Patrick Fruzetti. Patrick is a partner and managing director at Rose Advisors at Hightower. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to have you on. And can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and Rose Advisors? Yeah, sure, Ryan. Honestly, it's an honor to be on with you. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, so Rose Advisors, we're, we're a registered investment advisor. Um, and we're, we're at Hightower. We're one of approximately 150 teams at Hightower. We were one of the, the first uh, to join Hightower and its, and its founding, really, uh, back in 2010. And, um, you know, Hightower is an independent advisory group. So we're not a big bank. You know, we're truly an independent advisor. We're not selling products to, to our clients um, and charging, you know, commissions and that we're a true registered investment advisor and a fiduciary for our clients. Um, we manage uh, about 1.6 billion, and it's across, you know, mostly families, individuals, some foundations and nonprofits. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. I started my career at Lehman Brothers. Um, saw that, saw that go away uh, back in 08, and got into this side of the business. And honestly, I love it. I live it and I love it. And this is something I will be doing probably for the rest of my life, not even just the rest of my career. I love managing money. You know, I got into managing money uh, years ago. I hope we get to talk a little bit of, you know, maybe bring in a few historical things. Uh, I love reading about financial history. Uh, I mean, my brother handed me a book I grew up in Massachusetts, so my brother handed me a book by Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street, when I was probably 12 years old. And, uh, you know, so I just, those, those kind of things really why I got into the markets. And, and I tried to bring that to my clients. You know, I really, you know, managing money for individuals, particularly, a lot of it's built on education. You know, you have to educate your clients on, you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it, why you mitigate risk, you know. Why, you know, owning certain companies may not be the right thing just because you read it or, some, you know, someone told you about it. So those are, those are a lot of things we try to instill, you know, it's really that educational component to our clients and then putting together, you know, really good, thoughtful plans for, for you know, clients to make uh, the best financial decisions for their lives, for their families. Some people use the term financial quarterback. I like that term. I think that's a cool term. You know, I'm a sports guy, um, but I just think it's, uh, you know, that 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 works for me. And uh, so that's that's really what we do. We're based in New York, uh, New York City, but we have clients all around the U.S. now, um, even really all around the globe, quite honestly. So awesome. I'm excited to be here and kind of talk a little bit more uh, about the markets and what we've been going through. Uh, Patrick, that's fantastic. It's interesting. So 2008, 2009, you made that switch to Hightower, you know, went independent. Yeah. Really before, like, it got to be really popular recently. I've had a lot of guests on talking about the wave of going independent, whether it's to like a firm, like, you know, maybe a hybrid type firm or, or truly independent. So you've been, you were ahead of the curve there. Um, go in the high tower and then education. I love that you brought that up because I think that's probably one of my favorite parts about the, you know, what I do and, and what it's just so important to educate investors of what's out there, what, you know, what might be a scam. There's just so much stuff out there, so much noise 
that's such an important piece. And especially since, you know, it's been a while since I've been in high school and college, there's not a lot of, you know, financial education out there yeah. or, you know, investment education being done in, in, you know, high school and so on. So it's so important. I'm really glad you brought that up and good job in doing that with your clients. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. I mean, I, again, I agree with you totally. I mean, when you think about just what it takes to, you know, takes to sort of educate yourself financially. And I think about, you know, what it took, you know, what it took me. And it's just, it's a lot of reading, a lot of studying, asking a lot of questions. And that's really what uh, I encourage, you know, my clients to do. And, and yeah, I think you're right around, you know, Hightower. Hightower had a little bit of a first mover advantage. I mean, they weren't the very first, obviously, but they got started right after the financial crisis. And again, the, the big thing for me is um, now there was just so many people who were at, you know, the big banks and maybe even people who are there now, there were just, there were so many conflicts, you know, just with these banks. Again, I was on the, when I was at Lehman, I wasn't even on the advisory side. I was more on the, the fixed income banking side, oh, okay. you know, doing mortgage bonds, so, you know, and things like that. So you think about, it, I really made a transition over and now doing this, there was just such a conflict with just banks sell products, um, you know, and then just being a true fiduciary for a client. So really cool place to be and happy you know, uh, we settled up, um, you know, with our firm at Hightower. I'd, I'd love to spend the whole episode talking yeah. about like that stuff and how we got yeah, yeah. into the industry. There's always fantastic stories there, but we should probably yeah. talk a little bit about markets. Of course. That's your specialty. That's what you love. Um, and it's just fascinating right now what's going on. You know, like I said, equity volatility has spiked. You know, in fact, the S&P 500, went almost 18 months without a 2% decline. Now there have been yeah. more, there have been two, 2% 2 declines in like two weeks. You know, what has caused this volatility? Was it, and do you think it was like a flash crash or is it something more systematic and a sign of market weakness ahead? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't call it a flash crash, but it did kind of act like a margin call. You know, it, like just the the action in the stock market, and it really started with the news out of Japan, right? I mean, and yeah. you know, it's, it's well been well, you know, written at the, at this point around the uh, the carry trade, right? I mean, it's been going on forever. I mean, the yen is <clears throat> sorry, you know, just borrowing in yen has been an advantageous trade for a long time, and, and you know, they came out last the uh, <clears throat> you know t Tuesday or so. Um, you know, it was late July, last day of July, I believe, or second to last day, and they raised rates and unexpectedly. And, you know, when things are unexpected, that can create, as you know, market market panics. And it, it, it certainly upended that trade. And, you know, what are what are big investors, uh, institutional investors, probably a lot of hedge funds doing when they're using that, you know, that that carry trade? They're buying, you know, they're buying indexes. They're buying, you know, the big tech is likely weighted there. Uh, so it started started there, right? So that was sort of the case of, you know, someone called it the shakedown of the over, over leveraged investors, right? Yeah. And so if that was the shakedown, you kind of think, all right, and people talking about should the Fed react? It's not, you know, I wouldn't say that that alone would be cause too much concern, sort of margin call, market clearing event, get back at it. But then Friday, right? And it's always this pile on effect, Ryan, you know this. Friday, you get the jobs report and you're like, okay, now we're worrying about the kind of, people are talking about an emergency cut. I'm saying, my goodness, you, you know, you, they want you, you know, they, they want to uh, eliminate recessions or something, you know, we, maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. But the point is, is that there was this expectation now of, you know, is this, is this economy, have some recessionary signals, right? So that was Friday. And then over the weekend, like I said, with people, are, these over levered investors are buying stock, buying stocks, especially tech. Of course, good old Warren Buffett says, I sold half my Apple stock last quarter, <laughs> right? So he sells half his Apple stock and say, oh no, now that, and then Nvidia, they delay in one of their chips. So you just started to see it spill over. And then Monday, of course, it was really opened up um, and was was incredibly weak. And so, um, you know, th there's there's a lot to unpack there of where the, you know, the first part of it, probably not as much of a concern, but as you continue on and you think about, you know, 
is this a reflection of a slower economy? Um, then in which case maybe the Fed should, you know, should step yeah. in. And then the, the third thing, you know, just around, uh, you know, the t tech stocks, Magnificent Seven, everyone talks about it. But, you know, maybe there's this realization by someone like Buffett that, you know, with this whole AI momentum, crazy trade um, that's been going on, it's been more than a trade. I mean, it's been been a long time, but with this with this move that um, that a lot of people have enjoyed is maybe the realization that these companies have invested a ton of money into this AI and like, you know, there's a cost of capital and a return on capital or an expected return on capital. And maybe, maybe it's just this realization that some of these multiples and these expectations aren't totally realistic. And again, if that's the case, you know, you could see uh, some more market noise ahead. Hmm. That sound brings back some uh, flashbacks of the 2000s, right? The dot-com crash um, yeah. with valuations that maybe are a little bit stretched and, and stuff like yeah. that. You brought up a lot of great points there. And, and we're going to talk about the economic part of it. But that to me is... Yes, I think um, you brought up NVIDIA and the Magnificent Seven. Yes, I think they were stretched a little bit. Valuations were lofty. And, and you see that, I think, play a role in um, that unwind of that trade. But to me, the, the nugget that you said there was about the economic side. But let's um, continue talking about NVIDIA. You know, there was a rotation out of growth, particularly those mega tech stocks and, and into yeah. value and and small caps really since June. You know, NVIDIA has been down after being a darling for the majority of 2024, it's down 27% from its peak. Do you think that rotation is going to continue? And if so, that rotation into value and small caps, is that a signal for maybe a new market dynamic or a, or a shift in monetary policy coming up? Well, you know, we started to get a little bit of that in 2022, right? And then it kind of faded, right, for until now. And now it's come back. So it's been trying, right? And what I say is that that, of course, would be the logical thing to happen, right? Where, you know, the growth stocks, again, you're sort of getting sort of late, really late cycle. The Fed could potentially cut, which, you know, is is never necessarily a good sign. Uh, people may seem to get excited about it, but it's not a good sign. We'll talk about that. But but really, with when you, when you think about the the rotation into value, um, like if if you can, I do think that we're beginning to see it. We should see more. I hope we see more. It just means you're investing in companies that generate cash, where you don't you, know, you don't need an expansion of multiple for the investment to work. If that's what if that's part of your investment thesis today, I think you're going to struggle a little bit. If you're hoping, oh, you know what, all this has to do is go from a 22 multiple to a 27 multiple, multiply the EPS. We're done. You know, we're up 30 points. Like it, it's just going to be that's that's not going to work. Yep. Um, just because I expect the cost of capital to remain higher, but I do expect value. Small caps, on the other hand, I don't know. Maybe they're just. Um, <clears throat> You know, trading in tandem just because, you know, for whatever reason, I would say that small caps generally perform better, you know, when you're coming out of a recession, right? So I don't know. I I, I still think the jury's out on, on small caps. Value for sure. Um, you know, we own some value oriented uh, names. I think we yep. have a little bit more of a value bent to our strategy. Um, so I do think and, and expect that will eventually. Um, well, you know, will generate some outperformance. You know, you bring up a good point with small small caps. They tend to perform better when rates are coming down or rates are lower because they have to borrow a lot. And that costs yeah. of capital that you talked about. But with that being said, we're going to talk about this shortly. They tend not to do well during a recession or, right? Yeah. But when rates are coming down, what does that signal? you know, the Fed's probably seen a slowing economy. There's tends to be more, more often than not a recession that corresponds to falling interest rates. So that small cap play is, is an interesting one with um, dynamics at play there. Um, yeah. You talk no, I about, think you're right. Yeah, go ahead. No, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just, I think a little too early to tell. And I think, again, if we're heading to more of a recession and certainly a deep if we were going into a deeper recession you really wouldn't want to own it just for the 
the, you know, what you just cited there, but with lower rates, um, yeah, you should see a pickup in that, in that area within that, within that cap sector. You mentioned after all this uh, volatility, people were calling for an emergency cut, which I thought was kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, what do you think? September markets are pricing in a cut, um, yeah. 25 basis points, and now even probability of a 50 basis point cut. What What's your feeling there? Do you think 50 basis point cut in September? You know, I you uh, look at the the number seems to change every day. It looks like it's very possible. I mean, I think we're over 80% chance that it's a 50 bib cut. Um, I mean, the calls right when the market was cra was crashing for an emergency cut, I'm like, to do what? I mean, really to just to, to save some of your profits. I mean, it's just not how markets are supposed to work. And so uh, you and I know that. And I think the, so that was a little, a, a, a little crazy and, and premature. Um, you know, if it's 50 basis points, now, I don't, the, the, the problem now is that the Fed, as we know, has this dual mandate, whichever, right? So it's, it's been employment and inflation. Employment has not been an issue whatsoever through this entire tightening, throughout the entire tightening environment, not at all. So they could fight inflation as much as they want, okay? Employment was so tight. You know, again, COVID, the, the workforce got smaller for many, many different reasons. And now it's still pretty tight, but we started to see last Friday, we started to see that tick up. You see unemployment go up. Um, so I think that the Fed uh, you, well, will certainly see how much they weigh the importance of employment. I think they weigh it a lot. And so that's why I think they will make a cut in September. I think, you know, if he makes an argument for 50, he might be done for the year because you know, inflation is, is still around and it's, yep. you know, again, we, we can talk about all these different um, measures of inflation. Certainly one of the cool things, you know, some of the things that I look at measuring inflation and, and clearly the consumer is stretched. And so I think they want to, uh, to balance that. I think they've done a reasonably good job, um, you know, trying to manufacture oh, the whole soft landing and, and whatever. I, it's, thus far they have. Um, yeah. But it remains to be seen. And I think that they've spent so much time, Ryan, so much time tightening and trying to curb inflation as much as they can. You know, they just, uh, you know, I'd rather they be a little cautious when, you know, they start to lower again. So, again, I expect a cut in September and hopefully it's well messaged. Yeah, I think that spot on, Patrick, is it's a lot about the messaging, number one. And two, it's like markets... It, <laughs> I often talk about, you know, the pace of whether it's a um, hiking or or cutting, right? And and that's kind of what you should watch. If it's a 25 basis point cut, yes, it's slow, gradual, methodical. But if it's a 50 or 75, what's that telling markets? To me, that's saying, okay, maybe the economy is in worse shape than what we think, right? It's that pace um, that I typically watch. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, if you're, I mean, an emergency cut would be very bad signaling <laughs> and, and, and quite unnecessary, which is why, again, unless there's something else going on underneath that they see and they would just ultimately message that anyway, I just don't see it again. Like, there's no bank there. I mean, there hasn't been really, I haven't seen much in terms of liquidity issues. Um, there's no bank crisis like we had, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, by the way, it was only a year and a half ago that we escaped that. So, I mean, they, these things can come on very quickly. Um, so, you yeah. know, I, I think if they're just careful about it and, and deliver the message properly, I, I think it could be just received, um, could be received fairly well. But again, the reality is they're cutting rates and they're cutting rates for a reason. Yeah, exactly. You uh, mentioned and you've done some research here, and I thought this was really interesting. I've looked into it a little bit too about cutting rates, about a cutting rate cycle. You know, yeah. markets have done really well uh, until recently, but a lot of that is on the expectations that the Fed is going to cut rates, right? So markets have done well. Uh, and investors are expecting a rate cut. But should investors rejoice in the upcoming cutting cycle or should they be careful for what they wish for? 
you know, um, I think uh, they need to be a little careful just based on history. And it's typically about seven months um, after the first Fed cut, you know, in a series of cuts, I'm not just saying a one-off, but in a series of cuts, usually about seven months after the market bottoms um, to the tune of like at least 20%. Okay. Um, so that's a possibility. Again, we're, like you said, we're down from the peak, what, six, six some odd percent. Yeah. Um, so again, that's not the end of the world. And then also S&P earnings about a year after the first cut are down about 10%. Um, so the, that's typically what happens following the first easing. And, and usually the period in between is usually a good period. Well, we're coming to, it seems like we're coming to the end of that. So yeah, I would say it's a little bit of, you know, careful, careful what you wish for if you think it's going to be be the you know the savior you know it's the whole i saw someone heard someone the other day say this it was you know can the fed put humpty dumpty back together again and you know they're not putting it together by by cutting rates so yeah it's interesting i i agree i think we need to be careful for what we wish for because you know if they cut rates and they're able to do a soft landing that's probably going to be really good for markets. But yeah. if they are cutting rates and it may be quick and the economy does go into a recession, history shows them and what's the terminology. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. I could see, you know, markets, markets falling, um, you know, cutting rates in a recession. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I think it's also weaker hands. I heard a stat this morning around retail investors the last time retail uh, participation in the market was this high 1999 and 2007 yeah i'm not saying that's an indicator but you know if you're if you're looking at the the stats that's the last time retail and again it, it it is much easier now to participate so there's a factor there at play you know it's you know these low cost or no cost um you know services that are out there brokers um it's much easier to participate but it's still worth just noticing you know who the participants in the market are patrick you brought up a great point i don't often hear about this so and a lot of those new investors that are investing right in robin hood they haven't experienced a mark a big market crisis it's been since the pandemic they've had this fantastic run they're making money and you know, meme stops is a stocks and all this stuff. They're doing well. They haven't seen a steep, steep sell off and a recession. You got to think, you know, one of the things as a financial advisor, you have to try and keep them calm, mm -hmm. keep them invested, you know, keep them aware of, you know, long term. But how do these retail investors who are in Robin Hood, how are they going to react when the market crashes and and it's just down week after week and we're in a recession are they gonna you know add to it by a lot of selling um you bring up a very good point then yeah, it's classical you know sorry it's classic you know investor psychology yeah. and this sort of you know the, the investor behavior which is especially with that group i would say um are definitely ripe for just throwing in the towel, right? I say, yeah, this is it. And I was making money for a while and I just can't do it anymore. And it's a, you know, part of it with that, like something like Robinhood, it's the, it's the gamification, the gamification of investing. And when you lose the game, it's just like, it's all right, I'll shut the game off and I'll move on, right? That's kind of it. And I, so I think that that could definitely, you know, could definitely add on the margin to some of the pressure. And, Honestly, Ryan, I think we need it. It's totally healthy to have these market events. I mean, if you know, if yeah. you can't take a market decline, I mean, you just you shouldn't be investing in the market, right? And again, everyone's happy when things are going well and there's this complacency which we've had. Um, but you know, that that isn't how we that's not how I, you know, run my strategy. You know, I obviously I, I have wealthy clients. My job is to keep them, keep them there, keep them wealthy, and then you know trying to grow, grow their portfolios at a you know at a reasonable and responsible rate. I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, it was like on fixed income was a perfect example in 2022. It's the biggest drawdown for Bloomberg Egg and in yeah. history and and all this stuff. 
yes, it was painful. Yes, it hurt. But to me, it was needed because now all those savers are finally able to get 5%, 6% yield when for years they were 2% yield, right? So while it was painful, it reset everything. And to me, it was needed because now you got these savers that could get out of the riskier assets that were trying to find yield, hunt for yield, and get back into uh, safer things. And, and you could say that's similar to the equity market, you know, bring those valuations down a little bit. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, you know, in the end, you want an improvement in real yields. Um, and so I think being able to benefit from an improved real yield helps those savers, right? And it helps mitigate, you know, again, just getting back to the psychology of it is like, helps mitigate some of the volatility, which in the end, if you can mitigate more volatility than the market, right? So even if you were just had an equity strategy that mitigates more volatility than the market, and you can keep people in longer, that's a responsible thing to do. Because the you know, and I know, the best thing over time for people to do is to stay in the market. And so if you can avoid the really sharp, sharp declines because you own, you know, uh, riskier stocks or, or, or what have you, um, you know, stocks that are just more susceptible to volatility, if you can mitigate that some, I think you're also, you know, that's a big, that's an important factor. Um, and, and I think just to, and then I think bonds overall, when you're looking at an asset allocation, help to do that. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Um, you brought up earlier, uh, the jobs report, poor jobs report just added yeah. to the, to the stress of markets and kind of that panic. Where are we? What do you think about the recession? Uh, is it becoming more likely, um, take out your crystal ball? Yeah. You know, I Gosh, a year and a half ago, I thought maybe even two years ago, I would have thought we would have been in a recession by now. I really did. Um, but we've had a very tight labor market. Um, I think that, you know, avoiding any major, you know, financial issues has been helpful. Yeah. Uh, last year, we probably could have headed into one, you know, back in, back in February, March. Um, so... You know, looking forward, though, I think what we have to look for um, is, you know, are our companies, you know, still able to grow? Are people yeah. still, you know, um, are wages continuing to grow? Um, I haven't seen those signs yet. I haven't. I, you know, if I were to look forward, you know, next six months, no, I don't think, you know, I don't mm -hmm. think we're heading into a recession. But there are definitely cracks. You know, and I think it starts with, again, if, if this labor market's turning over, you know, we're probably headed for one. It's, you know, at least by this time next year, if that's happening. And I'd say, you know, I mentioned the consumer being stretched. Yeah. It's something like um, about 12 million people. That's like one in four renters spend half their income on rent and utilities, over half yeah. their income on rent and utilities. That's a squeeze consumer. And so, you know, the, that velocity of money, you know, as that reduces, yeah. I think that can put some pressure and certainly some economic, broader economic pressure on there. Um, but I look at all these things. I look at different measures of inflation. Um, okay. um, so, you know, I, I think just right now, I, I don't really see it. Um, and I listen to what companies say, you know, I invest in a portfolio of companies, you know, we run a separately managed account strategy here for our equity portfolio. So I'm speaking to companies uh, all the time, I'm speaking to suppliers, I'm speaking to investors. Um, not only that I invest in, I also just speak to people who run companies, could be small private businesses. Yeah. Like what are they seeing? What are they doing? Um, are they investing is what's key. And I think that, you know, so long as they're still hiring, I think that's a positive. And um, yeah. you don't see, you know, I haven't seen like the massive layoffs. I know in tech post COVID, there was yeah. a lot of noise. Intel did not have a great, uh, it was kind of a rough, you know, rough report they had last week. Um, so again, if that, if that's the start of something, then, you know, yeah, we, we probably are just that I haven't seen enough info yet or enough data. Yeah, I agree. You know, the labor, the jobs report was eye opening. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important to keep an eye on there. You also had, 
what was interesting and talk about the yield curve yield curve's been inverted for i think the longest <laughs> period of time without a recession yeah right and now it's steepening i think it might have become uninverted recently yeah um, so what usually that signals but there's all these signals out there but i like what you say it, what are the companies doing laying off people the consumer consumer has been resilient are they going to yeah. continue to spend and so on yeah um, yeah so like the that, yeah, I was going to say, like, you're right, the inverted yield curve has traditionally told us that, but we've been in the spot. And honestly, Ryan, we know part of the yield curve is it's, it's manipulated, right, to a degree, right, with the Fed's buying this or not, right? So I don't know, it's a little tougher, I think, to use as an indicator, but it may be, you know, it may in the long run be right and say, oh, well, the recession finally came after five years or three years or whatever it is, and, and, and you're there. Um, but you now I also, you know, mentioned just, you know, again, on looking at where labor, where, where measure, <clears throat> trying to find ways to measure where the labor, uh, how the strength of the labor force and the strength of labor and their, and their, their power to increase wages. But, you know, I also look at some of these, you know, some of these old indices may come back. I mean, it's been talked about for a little while now is the misery index, right? Yeah. You know, if we see that, I mean, that was a big thing back in the 70s, right? So you start to see things like the misery index. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about inflation. The other one I like is the one the economists came out with the 80s is the Big Mac index. Now, they use the Big Mac index more for indicator of how strong certain currencies are versus yeah. each other because Big Mac sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, is, is, is available all across the globe. Yeah. Um, but when you look at the price of it, right? I mean, over the last 10 years, it's up over 40%. I mean, these things, and then, uh, you know, strate uh, this, this research firm, uh, Strategus, uh, that we listen to read a lot about, uh, Jason Trenner, I'm a big fan of his. You know, they have this indicator called the Common Man CPI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Common Man CPI is looking at, you know, food, energy, shelter, clothing. What's the cost of everyday things? The common man, the cost of everyday living, what's going on there. And if you look at it, um, it's beat, been beating CPI for, I think, close to a year now. So again, inflation still sticking around and that's mm -hmm. going to be a factor in yep. all of this going forward. And I, I just, you know, I just hope that it's well managed um, because what would be worse out of all this, you know where I'm going is they cut rates and they're like, we cut too much. Now they got to raise them back again. That would, that would not be good you. that you yeah. want to see a good correction. Have the fed, <laughs> have the fed pull that one off. Exactly. And the fed has already got a credibility issue. Can yeah. You imagine? Yeah. Like, yeah. That yeah. wouldn't add, that wouldn't do too much, too much for their reputation. <laughs> Patrick, with that being said real quickly, last thing here, yeah. how should investors position their portfolios for all this uncertainty and what we've just talked about? Yeah. I mean, I've I've been saying it all year since the top of the year. I've said now is the time to uh, to reposition, uh, to rebalance is the word I've been using, right? And so you had this run in equities. Go back to what think about what your balance was going into this. You know, if you had a certain amount of stock, certain amount of uh, fixed fixed income, certain amount of uh, you know hard assets, real estate, income producing real, whatever it is. Time to, to rebalance that a little bit. You still have an opportunity to do it. Stick to it, right? You know, when we talked about risk mitigation, we talked about earlier. If you're gonna manage risk, you gotta be able to rebalance at any at any at any given time. You know, and it's not just oh, let's just go, you know, sell our winners and hold on to some of the losers. You don't do that. that by the way, that's a great Peter Lynch quote. Selling your winners and holding your losers is like cutting the flowers and watering the weeds. <laughs> so don't do that. It. Just rebalance the whole thing. Don't yes. pick and choose. Just be rebalance it. Be very methodical about it. And I think we're good. I think you should have just to end still own, you know, you can still own stocks, good cash mm -hmm. flowing stocks. You know, you want to own good businesses that can perform in an inflationary environment. Uh, it's, it's, uh, owning some fixed income, I think makes a lot of sense now. I think owning some precious metals, um, even though gold has rallied here, I like owning some of the precious metals. Um, having some commodity exposure as well, I think, even having some energy mixed in there works. And then if you can, and you have some interesting, 
you know, ways to maybe potentially invest in some other hard assets like income producing real estate. Um, you know, we invest in some farm farmland as well, you know, just things like that to have a nice balanced portfolio where you don't have as much correlation risk, I think makes a lot of sense. And now's a good time to do it. You know, it's a great opportunity. There's no reason not to, even with a little bit of a correction. I mean, who cares? You know, yeah. it's not like, you know, this isn't 19, October, 1987. You're exactly right. Patrick, thank you so much. It was really a fun conversation. Love talking markets with you. Um, great insight and things that are very valuable for investors and, and other financial advisors. Thank Thanks, you so Ryan. much for coming on, Patrick. It was really an honor to have you on. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast. You can watch all of our other podcasts on the Zephyr YouTube channel, as well as on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Thank you, and have a great rest of your week.